In researching his book, The Accidental Empire, Gershom Gorenberg discovered in Israel's archives these documents marked top secret. Written in September 1967 by Foreign Ministry lawyer Theodore Meron, the memos are a warning that civilian settlement contravenes the explicit provisions of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which protects people living under occupation. It means that it violated international law. But if Theodore Moran's legal opinion was correct, how is it that Israelis would build as many as 250 settlements and outposts in the middle of Arab land? Israel's official position is that its settlements do not violate international law. It calls the West Bank disputed territory, not occupied, because it says it was never a recognized independent country. The real problem is, you can call it pragmatic, you can call it legal. Was the war over? It was not. Forty years later, we spoke to Theodore Moran, a Holocaust survivor who became one of the world's most respected authorities on international law. He stands by his top secret memos to the Israeli leaders. You can justify a lot of things on grounds of security, but you cannot settle your population in occupied territories. No doubt in your mind? No doubt. No wiggle room in the law? Not really. Certainly when somebody can present you the Torah and the Bible and say, look, this is our land, then any man-made law is in confrontation with God's law. I cannot argue with the word of God. Any lawyer can only discuss things from the secular perspective. In other words, I do not believe that religion can resolve legal disputes. I want you all as close to me as possible. Mazel tov. 6,000 miles from Israel's settlements in the heart of Manhattan, Defiance of international law comes dressed in diamonds. Here, Shani and Dove Heikind, two of God's Jewish American warriors, are a whirlwind of schmooze. Good to see you, Mike. Thanks for being here. She is the daughter of a prominent rabbi. He is a New York State representative, a power couple. They met in the 1970s working for Mayor Kahane the notorious Brooklyn rabbi whose motto was for every Jew a 22. The Hikins have gone from being Kahane's street fighters to these fancy feeding grounds. Here they carefully cultivate American Jewish support. You're doing great. You're doing great. For a controversial mission. Jewish settlement of the occupied territories and East Jerusalem. The people who went to some of these areas really believe in something. Most of us just believe in making another buck. I don't know why anyone would object to it. They object, his critics do, because Jewish settlements violate international law. That's according to a 2004 opinion from the International Court of Justice. My government believes that international law sets the appropriate standards. From the earliest days of the settler movement, even the United States, Israel's closest ally, blasted Israel's settlement policy. Substantial resettlement of the Israeli civilian population in occupied territories, including in East Jerusalem, is illegal. Ever since, American presidents, both Democrat and Republican, have spoken from virtually the same script. They consistently oppose settlement growth. The United States will not support the use of any additional land for the purpose of settlements. The United States policy was that there should be no more settlements. I know that our nation has differences with the nation of Israel over settlements. Israel must remove unauthorized outposts and stop settlement expansion. So why not withhold some of America's generous foreign aid to pressure Israel? I asked former President Jimmy Carter. America gives Israel $3 billion a year, no questions asked, just about. Why doesn't it say, okay, no more $3 billion? There's no way that a member of Congress would ever vote for that and hope to be re-elected. 
John Mearsheimer, a prominent political scientist at the University of Chicago, co-authored one of the most controversial essays of late, arguing pro-Israel advocates have too much influence on American policy. The lobby goes to great lengths to make sure that U.S. policymakers privilege Israel over the Palestinians. The pro-Israel lobby he's talking about is a loose coalition of PACs, professional lobbyists and grassroots activists. Thanks. Thanks, great. Michael. Always oh, great. Thanks. To the right. A little bit that way. They are primarily secular organizations. Our good friend, Senator Harry Reid. But the lobby's political clout has helped the staying power of religious settlers in the West Bank. The United States has never been able to put serious pressure on Israel to halt settlement building. And of course the reason is because of the power of the lobby. Except in 1991, when then President Bush did pressure Israel on the settlement issue and a very public feud erupted with the lobby. President George Bush and his Secretary of State James Baker were trying to push Israel into peace talks with the Palestinians. Nothing has made my job of trying to find Arab and Palestinian partners for Israel more difficult than being greeted by a new settlement every time I arrive. So the Bush administration took an unprecedented step. U.S. loan guarantees for housing in Israel would now come with strings attached. We will support our loan guarantees if there is a halt or an end to um, settlement activity. Those were fighting words. I've heard today there were something like a thousand lobbyists on the hill working the other side of the question. We got one lonely little guy down here doing it. So, uh, so... Uh, there were a thousand lobbyists, many from the powerful American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, known as APAC. Its annual convention in Washington sends members out to work the hill. On the issue of loans, Congress got the message. We should stick with our friends. It's just not the right or fair way to treat an ally. By forcing the fight, the president gets in the way of the peace process. President Bush vowed to stand firm. I'm not going to shift the foreign policy of this country because of political expediency. I can't do that and have any credibility worldwide. But just a few months later, the very week of the Republican National Convention, the pro-Israel lobby had something to celebrate. President Bush announced his support for the loan guarantees. And to this day, no other administration has so publicly threatened to withhold financial support because of the settlements. We've been able to promote strong, close U.S.-Israel relations. For Israel's friends on Capitol Hill, the pro-Israel lobby writes legislation, offers free trips to Israel, and contributes money. No real secrets. They do all the things that we're permitted to do in a democracy. As for political enemies, pundits still talk about the drubbing Senator Charles Percy took in 1984. They pressured me, they threatened me. Percy had supported selling high-tech military planes to another U.S. ally, Saudi Arabia. Pro-Israel activists spent millions to bankroll his opponent's campaign, and Percy lost. Since then, they've said they will Percyize senators that don't adhere to their policy. Most recently, former President Carter was criticized for criticizing Israel's treatment of the Palestinians in his book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. You're an anti-Semite. It's very difficult to speak publicly in criticism of Israel. And let me explain why I think you're a bigot, a racist, and an anti-Semite. I've been uh, publicly called anti-Semitic, even in full-page advertisements in the New York Times. I think they were not only trying to marginalize and silence Carter by smearing him, they were also sending a message to anyone else in the body politic who had thoughts about criticizing Israel.